Hello, this is Dr. Mewborn, and this is Christology. We're in the midterm review. I'm calling it Lesson 20 just because of where it is and falls on our timeline, but we're looking at the midterm review today. And so I want to go ahead and give you um, what I've already given you in a PDF form, but now I want to give it to you in kind of a slide format. So I'll walk through these very quickly so that you can see what the test is, or what you'll be asked of um, with the test. So make sure that you know these different things. Um, I'm going to ask you a little bit about Ritz School and Slime Marker, Marker um, and what they believed and things like that. And so try to make sure that you know about them. That's an important thing. As you continue on, I'd like for you to know a little bit about who Charles Darwin is, what he believed, of course, the theory of evolution, and then Herbert Spencer, he advocated a theory of progressive social evolution, and kind of understand that a little bit as well. That's an important thing for you to know about in context and culture. I'll ask about the fundamentalist controversy. Of course, I want you to know what modernism is, and uh, modernism is this focus on getting out any form of supernatural activity, miracles, or miraculous activity through the Bible. Everything can be explained through science, that whole focus. That's what modernism is all about. And so um, it caused so many people to doubt the historical accuracy of the biblical text, and it questioned the biblical authority. Um, and we kind of see that the, the downslope of what happens when a person starts with Christianity, and they become liberal in their thinking, and they become more really modernist in their thinking, where they'll get all the way to the point of there is no deity, no atonement, no resurrection, and eventually they'll get to the point they do not believe in God. In athe that's what they'll believe in is atheism. Okay, uh, I'd love for you to know the five fundamentals that are given to us that really helped point out what a fundamentalist was back in the 1920s and 30s. And so these five beliefs that'd be important to know. What is neo-orthodoxy? Please under, be able to under, understand and explain what is neo-orthodoxy. And that's based on uh, this slide, defines the word of God as Jesus. It teaches that the Bible is a medium of revelation, not revelation itself. And then kind of know uh, some points of that. Of course, know who Rudolf Bultmann is and the rise of Bultmannism. Um, this is important when we're looking at understanding liberal theology. Uh, Boltman, and I've got a couple of slides here that I will send to you as well in a um, in a PDF form. But Boltman was known for demythologizing scripture, and you can see it in this last point here. The gospel writers used the only terms and concepts they had available to them at the time, and those terms and concepts were inextricably bound to the miraculous and supernatural, which Boltman saw as a myth or um, saw as myth. And so he was demythologizing these things, the scripture, and telling you what he believes the disciples meant when they wrote things down, not what was really happening. It'd be important to know the doctrine of the Trinity, which is based on the idea that there's three persons, yet one God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, each possessing all divine attributes, but they have different functions. Please know the five proofs that the Bible is true. These proofs are, there's no contradictions in the Bible. Archaeology speaks to truth. The more people dig, the more people uh, expose truth of the scripture or expose to others the truth of the Bible. Uh, science proves the Bible. Prophecy proves the Bible. And it works is another way of proving the Bible is true. All right. Um, it'd be very important to know the I am statements in the Gospel of John. I am the bread of life, the light of the world, the door of the sheep, good shepherd, Resurrection the life, way, truth, and the life. I am the true vine. And it'd be important to know uh, several of those. I won't ask you to know all of them, but I'll definitely ask you to know several of them. All right. Um, Jesus is eternal. Here's some verses that speak of Jesus' eternality. And so if you can know these verses and what, they, what they're about, that would be very important. Looking at John 1, 1, Colossians 1, uh, chapter 1, and then Revelation 1, 18. Um, some more verses on that. You see John 3, 17, really, God did not send his son into the world to condemn. So God sent his son, um, so he must have come from somewhere because he's eternal. John 3, 31, Jesus has come from above. John 6, 38, uh, I have come down from heaven. That's speaking of Jesus' eternality. The nature of Christ. Um, it'd be important to understand and be able to define kenosis and then give the example of Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, when Jesus in verse 7 says, but emptied himself, 
speaking of Jesus, by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. That's kenosis, and that's important to be able to know. The next I'll ask about God's um, character or his attributes. And the, you, will, you will see these through his omnipresence. Omni meaning all or all things, and presence meaning uh, where he is, his actual being and where he is. So God is all present everywhere. And so we see that in some of the scriptures. We know where he is. We know that he knows uh, all things or has access to that, definitely even in the person um, of Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry. So it's omnipresence, uh, omniscience, meaning he's all-knowing. Um, that's what science means here. So he's all knowledgeable of all things. And so it's important to be able to see some of those passages there. Um, see some more passages on the omniscience of God. Omnipotence, meaning he is all powerful. And uh, he's powerful to forgive sins, uh, power over heaven and earth, power over nature, power of sin and death, power to give eternal life, power to impute righteousness. He is the true superheroes of superheroes because he saved the world from their sin. Um, and so that's the truest form of salvation, the kind of we talked about that slide before. His immutability, which means God does not change. He never changes. He keeps his word, keeps his character, he keeps his position, nothing. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God remains forever. So that's another attribute to know of him. He's sovereign, which simply means he alone reigns. The word sovereignty means supreme or independent power or authority over something. And so he's over all things. He alone is sovereign. We see that he's called, and here's more of his names here, and we have Jehovah's his first one. Jehovah is God's unique name is revealed in the Bible. Uh, the name Jehovah is an English translation of the Hebrew name for God. We look at the words, uh, we look at the four letters, Y-H-W-H, which sometimes we say is Yahweh. But if you put vowels in certain places, you don't have Yahweh, you have Yahovah. And so that's called the Tetragrammaton because we don't know where the vowels went or what the vowels were necessarily because they were simple just marks in the Hebrew language. And so um, uh, people were afraid to say Jehovah. They were afraid to say Yahweh because they didn't know where the vowels were. So they're afraid of taking God's name in vain. The Jews were. And so they didn't say it. Instead, in the place of this, they would say Adonai. And, um, and so that was speaking to him as the master, the ruler, the heavenly father, and a definitely beloved relationship with that word. Um, so it would be good to know Jehovah. Elohim would be another word that it would be good to know, uh, speaking about meaning, uh, the word meaning God is supreme or he is the mighty one, referring to one true God, um, and, and that's important to think about. Um, Adonai. The word Adonai is simply the word for Lord. Lord is defined in the English as someone or something having power, authority, influence, a master or ruler. So someone who is master of the house. And uh, that's the idea, the one who is in charge. And so God is Adonai. Jesus is also called Son of God refers to his eternal relationship with the Father. I'm not going to ask you to know all the verses that I'm going to lay out here, but being able to understand that Jesus is the Son of God. In Matthew 3, it speaks of his baptism. He says, this is my beloved Son, whom I'm well pleased. Um, you see in other passages where Jesus called uh, the Son of God, there in Acts chapter 13, um, and so it would be very important to kind of know what is the Son of God? How is Jesus related to the Son of God? How does the Son of God relate to the Father? Those types of things. So that would be important. Uh, the first begotten, New Testament term, Greek, prototakos, which means firstborn or preeminent, first type of, uh, of some things. Jesus Christ is the first type of many things. Firstborn among the brothers, firstborn among Mary, firstborn from the dead. Jesus is very different from Adam. That even though Jesus is called the second Adam, he truly is the first of his kind in this way. Jesus is from heaven. Adam is from the earth. That's very different. Jesus was sent from heaven, and Adam was created. Those are differences in, uh, in who, um, who Jesus is compared to Adam. Um, Jesus is the true um, revelation of God in the flesh. Adam was made in the image of God. You can see some of the differences there. So 
That's important to look at. And then only begotten, it's Greek word monogonase, only or one and only, the meaning the only one of its kind within a specific relationship, okay? And so this is an important phrase to understand speaking of who Jesus is. He's the only one like he is, that, 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 that's like him on the earth, okay? And that's important. All right. Uh, another passage that's important to know about is Colossians chapter 1, really verses 15 through 17, or 15 and 16, because it speaks of him. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Uh, and that'd be a great verse for you to be able to know about. Next thing is theophanies in the Bible. Definition of theophany, combination of two words that mean God, theos, and um, appearance, phaino. And so a theophany is a visible or audible display to human beings that expresses the presence of and character of God. Okay, I know a little bit about what that is all about with theophanies. Theophanies in the Bible, here's some examples, Mount Sinai, burning bush, appearances of, to Abraham, uh, Isaac, Jacob, those types of things. What is typology? Type, typos, may serve as a mold, a pattern, or example. Logi, logia, the, the subject matter, the study of the words of something. Typology is primarily concerned with the application of an historical fact as an illustration of spiritual truth. So make sure that you know that. I gave this illustration before of the typewriter. Antitype is the real thing. The type is the image of the antitype. The hammer on an old typewriter was the antitype. When the hammer hit the paper through the ink ribbon, it left an image of the antitype. This image is called the type. When you pulled out the paper, the letters were mere type images of the original antitype. That's pretty important to look at. Um, Christ in the Old Testament typology. You see a few words here, typos, skia, hypodigma, and then simeon. Um, these words are important to speak. These Greek terms are very important when we're speaking about typology of Christ and kind of what they mean. Um, here's a good example of a type of Christ in the Bible with Joseph. Joseph was a type of Christ. It'd be, it'd be very good to know this middle section that's in yellow because it speaks of um, the, uh, the characteristic or attribute that Joseph has that, that also refers to Christ. Um, as we continue on with typical events, Noah and the ark is a good example of a type of Christ, and we can see some of the example or why we say that. God's divine provision, God told him he's going to save him from the flood or from the um, or from the from the wrath of God to come, and he's given him divine provision for that. He gave him a blueprint for that. Things were sacrificed so he could be saved, like trees. The ark was a refuge from God's wrath. Man was invited to the ark, all that type of stuff. Amazing to look at. As you continue on, the ark was a place of absolute security. The ark had only one door, which I think it's amazing. Jesus is the one way to God. Uh, once in the ark, God shut the door. God shut them in, the Bible says. One window offers powerful insight. Look up to God, not the world. All right. Another type is the tabernacle and Jesus. It'd be a great slide to know a little bit about um, understanding how the, the type with the ta tabernacle is very much like Jesus. Um, Christ in the Old Testament prophecy. Uh, if you can know the difference between general and personal um, messianic prophecies, that'd be very important and good. Continuing on, if you'll know the genealogy of Jesus, really what I'm looking at with this slide is the line of Mary is based on Matthew chapter 1. And we see that on the bottom section. And then the line of Joseph is based on Luke chapter 3. And you see that on that top right section. You see how they all come from King David. Um, and then that goes to Jesus Christ. And Luke goes back to Adam in that, um, in that reference. Okay. Uh, the lineage of Christ, why does it matter? Well, it establishes the historicity of Christ. Um, it authenticates the kingship of Jesus, it reveals the faithfulness of God, it magnifies the grace of the gospel, all those types of things. Um, the women in Jesus' lineage, there's five women, it'd be good to know uh, this little, these little facts about them, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, and Mary, and kind of who they were, and you kind of see a little blurb about that right there, that'd be good to know. As we continue on, please know John chapter 1, verses 1 through 15, be able to explain the incarnation of Christ with those verses. As we continue on, uh, be able to give me the trilemma. 
which is based on C.S. Lewis's comments and, um, and his writings on this, that Jesus is either a liar, a lunatic, or he must be Lord. And so, um, and he and he did that. So be able to give me the trilemma, the humanity of Christ. Why or why would we say he was human? Well, he had flesh and blood, experienced human development, had a soul and spirit, expressed characteristics of being a human. He was hungry, thirsty, tired. He had human emotions, and he had human names. Here's a great example of his humanity once he's even in his glorified body. Luke chapter 24, verse 37. It reads, but they were startled and frightened, thought they saw a spirit. When Jesus came to them in his resurrected body, verse 39, see my hands and my feet, that it is I myself touch me and see, for I, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. Um, and the, I believe this is the last thing I want you to kind of be able to do is give me some understanding of Jesus, Jesus receiving worship. And there's some passages out there about this. In, even in his earthly ministry, we see that in Matthew 14, of the, people, the disciples on the boat, they worshipped him. They said, truly, you are the Son of God. The mother of the sons of Zebedee came and worshipped Jesus. In John chapter 9, verse 38, after a man was healed, he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. And so we see some examples that Jesus received worship while in his earthly ministry. All right, well, that is what we call, I guess, Lesson 20, but it's our midterm review. I hope you do well, study hard, and uh, the test will be given to you soon. God bless you. Bye-bye.